Greetings, Risk Five friends. Well, it's time for another video, and you know what that means. I'm building, building a Risk Five processor, not on an FPGA. FPGA. So I have a few topics that I uh, want to talk about. Um, it's probably going to be a bit of a short video because there is not really going to be a whole lot of coding, just a bunch of drawing. Um, so. The first topic that I want to talk about is the uh, register multiplexer input thing layout. Um, and the last video, I went through it and I was using some 0.1 inch uh, pin headers. Um, and someone rightly pointed out that when you've got a whole bunch of those, um, the friction is so huge that, you know, once you put them together, you're probably not going to be able to get them apart. So, um, Somebody else suggested that I look into some of these other uh, sort of high density uh, connectors, and these are 0.4 millimeter uh, pitch connectors, uh, which is pretty small. Um, and I have an image of that uh, here. So this is the uh, printed circuit board layout uh, after I sort of squoze everything down a bit. Uh, I was able to compress things, um, ignore. Ignore this uh, side part uh, over here. Let's see if I can get it in green. Yeah, this side part, I haven't yet um, figured out what I'm going to do with the control lines, but basically uh, these things down here are the uh, little connectors that I can use. Um, and there are going to be two of them because I've basically split the circuit essentially in half, one for the lower 16 bits and one for the upper 16 bits. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, how separated they are because uh, the data lines just, you know, go one half to one side and one half to the other side and all the control lines are just hooked together. So, um, yeah, so so this is a, a pretty neat uh, board. The, the other thing is that this is stackable. Um, on the other side, um, I have the registers. Those are these two things. Um, and I don't have the models for the, uh, the connector, for the opposite uh, gender connectors uh, than these. So, you know, they're just sort of hanging out here. But you can sort of imagine that, you know, the, the boards can be stacked one on top of the other. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, and that's probably what I'm going to be going for. Um, the size of this board... I think I got it down to 120 millimeters by 70 millimeters or so, uh, which is pretty small. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with that, and I think that's what I'm going to go with. Um, so um, again, this is not the final circuit. This is just what I've been playing with. So, all right. Um, so the next topic, uh, the sequencer logic. Okay, so um, in the code, uh, basically, I had this uh, sequencer card, uh, and it was just this big monolithic piece of code. Um, and what I was able to do was separate out all of the register multiplexer things and all of the non-registered multiplexers. These are the multiplexers that go to the buses. Um, so I separated those out, and then I was left with a few other registers, like, you know, like one bit uh, registers for like the trap, um, the ALU, the, the three ALU uh, condition outputs, um, and a few other registers here and there. Um, and once I was able to separate that out, I was just left with a bunch of combinatorial logic. And this diagram sort of shows the, the combinatorial logic. Uh, what we've got here, we've got... Um, so just, just ignore the fact that these are ROMs. Uh, there are actually 76 control lines in the entire thing. Um, and there's uh, 20 bits, uh, 32 bits, and something like 35, 35 bits. Some of these are actually duplicates, so it's you know something more like 31 or 32 bits. So strictly as a monolithic combinatorial block, that would mean 32 input bits and 76 output bits. Now, forgetting about the output bits, if I were to treat the entire thing as a 32-bit input circuit, that would be essentially one gig a word, where a word is 76 bits. So, you know, if I had a ROM, I would need a ROM that was one gig a word. 
Um, and you know, if, if this were 76 bits, then you know, figure that's 10 bytes out. So I would need a 10 giga, but 10, 10 giga, 10, one gigabyte ROMs essentially to do that. Um, and I felt that there was probably a better way to do this. So I looked at it and I was able to actually separate out that monolithic block into three separate blocks. One block taking only 20 bits input, which is one meg, that's pretty good. Another block, um, which just handles traps, um, taking only 12 bits of input. And then another block, uh, which is just handling interrupt requests and loading of the instruction uh, that can take three inputs and only needed four outputs. So this is a really simple circuit. Um, the trap ROM is basically the thing that monitors for fatal exceptions and uh, other traps. Uh, and what happens is when there is a trap, it basically takes over from the other ROMs and it injects its own signals. So that's why there are 76 bits coming out of the, uh, the sequencer ROM. Um, these 32 bits that come out of the trap ROM um, get essentially ORed with, uh, with uh, the, the other 76 bits. Same thing with the IRQ and load ROM. So the end result is that I have three sections uh, and each section uh, has only a very few uh, number of input bits, which is really good because uh, because I managed to find uh, this uh, flash ROM um, and it is a well, it's a it says it's 16 megabits, but it's actually one meg by 16 bits out. Uh, so that's kind of convenient. Um, remember that we have a, a 76 bit output. So I just need a bunch of these, like five of these, um, or uh, yeah, five of these. Um, and because it's one meg uh, address uh, space, then that's just 20 bits in. So I just need five of these, uh, you know, and maybe one for the, uh, for the uh, trap uh, possible, possibly. So anyway, um, and these are flash, which means that um, I can take them out of the board, uh, flash them with an external circuit, and then put them back into the board. You know, or maybe I can leave it into in the board and you know put in like some plugs or something to to program them. So that's pretty nice because it it basically means that if I do make a mistake, you know, if for some reason all that formal verification was was all bad and wrong, um, I can just reprogram the thing. So that's kind of neat. Uh, okay, so yes, yeah, so that's that. Um, and I guess the, the final thing is uh, prove mode. So, you know, now that I've kind of gone through everything and I, I'm pretty sure that everything's going to work properly, I really need to do uh, a, an inductive proof on everything. Um, and that is what I'm working on right now. Um, the inductive proof basically means that I'm going to. Um, I'm going to run a, a simple check, a bounded model check on everything, and then um, the inductive prover takes over. So uh, with prove mode, you basically have to write a whole bunch more asserts uh, that, that you think you don't need, but really what it does is it reduces the state space because remember that the inductive proof uh, relies on a base case, which is your bounded model checking, um, and then your inductive case, uh, which is you start during any state and you just you know go uh, until you hit um, a, a bad state. Um, and those bad states uh, can start from anywhere. Uh, so I had to put in a whole bunch of asserts basically saying uh, what were valid states. Um, and again, you know, I went over this before, what you do is you just run your inductive proof and it fails. And then you take a look at the inductive trace um, and you see what bad state it started in. And then you eliminate that bad state um, by putting in some reasonable asserts. Um, so, you know, I, I did have to put a lot of them in. Um, and here's an example of uh, a fairly reasonable assert, which is um, when, when there is a trap and it's a fatal trap, then you're stuck in machine cycle zero. So in other words, once you've trapped fatally, 
um, it just sits there and, and spins and it doesn't do anything else. Um, otherwise, um, the trap actually takes uh, two instruction cycles um, and that's why the machine cycle would be zero or one. Um, so it's the, so, uh, so the reason that I had to put this in is that sometimes the inductive prover would say, oh, it's a fatal trap, we'll start from instruction cycle two. And that's wrong um, because you know that will actually never happen if if the if the machine is behaving itself, um, it'll never actually get into that state. Uh, so that's why I had to basically say, well, you know, if you're in a fatal trap, um, then you're going to be in machine cycle zero. There's no way for you to get to machine cycle one. Uh, and asserting that that happens uh, helps because in, in, first of all, in bounded model checking, you will see that you will never get past cycle zero. And in the inductive proof, that basically says, okay, well, you're never going to end in machine cycle one, so there you go. So uh, right now I'm just working on that. Um, with, all these, with all these assertions in place, um, the inductive proof is actually going uh, pretty quickly. Um, in fact, the only inductive uh, proof that is taking a long time is the fatal four um, section. So I, I broke uh, checking fatals into three parts. Uh, fatal one, uh, let's see, where do I have that? Fatal, 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 fatal. Oops, I think I skipped past it. Yeah, here we go. So here's fatal. Um, for fatal one, I'm just checking uh, loads. For fatal two, I'm just checking uh, the jumps. For fatal three, I'm checking op, op, im, and store. Um, so op and op, im because you can have an illegal instruction in there and store because you can also have misaligned instructions. Um, and then fatal four is all the rest. So it's, it's the all the rest thing that appears to be taking the longest amount of time. So not really sure why, but anyway, uh, that is really all I wanted to cover. So things are, uh, rapidly progressing. Once I get the inductive proof done, I'm actually going to start, um, building the sequencer because I know what the bus is going to look like. Uh, I know what the sequencer needs. I know what all the other cards need. Um, one of the interesting things that I did was I added uh, an exception card. So here, here is the exception card, which holds some of the CSRs, namely the MCOS, MEPC, and MTVAL. Um, I also have an IRQ card, um, which holds some other CSRs, the uh, M status, MIE, and uh, machine interrupt pending registers. Um, so I had to separate those out because it turns out that um, sticking them on separate cards actually made things a lot cleaner um, in terms of the combinatorial stuff. Now, yes, I did have to add some extra control lines onto the bus. Um, and, you know, there's more than a few, actually. Uh, but it's a cleaner design, I think, and uh, it was also uh, what enabled me to get that big combinatorial block for the ROM down to just 20 bits. So, um, so that's that's really all I have to say. There's there's not a whole lot um, left here. So, um, as you can see. So as you can see here, uh, we're just waiting for this final thing to, uh, to happen. Um, I have had several runs before, um, and again, when they fail, I just look at the trace and then I add some extra asserts. So this is, this is really the final step. And then once this succeeds, I'm just gonna run everything, um, and then I'll basically call the coding phase done, and we'll just start putting some schematics together. So I guess that's about it. Kind of a short video, kind of a pointless video, but you know, I just wanted to show some progress. So I guess until next week, see ya.